My name is uh, Adam. If we haven't met, I'm part of the team and it's great to be with you this morning. As Nathaniel mentioned uh, earlier, we are kicking off a brand new sermon series today, which we've called The Rise and Fall of Solomon. For the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at the story of Solomon, which we find in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. If you have your Bible with you, you can keep it open there to 1 Kings chapter 1, which is where we'll spend our time together today. Now, so many of the stories we love start with a bang. So maybe you think about the James Bond movies. They usually start with an action scene, and you can pick just about any movie in the franchise. Or the the bank robbery scene at the start of The Dark Knight. Or perhaps the greatest opening scene of all time, the landing on Omaha Beach in Saving Private Ryan. I'll never forget when I watched it for the first time, seeing that guy walking around looking for his arm, which had just been blown off. Well, with that wonderful image in our minds, when we turn to the story of 1 Kings, we see that it begins not with a bang, but with a whimper. It begins with a king who is old, cold, and in bed. King David is coming to the end of his life. He's about 70 years old at this stage. He's been reigning over Israel for about 40 years. But now he can't get himself warm, and he can't even get out of bed. King David is coming to the end of his reign and his life. Now, we've already looked at the story of King David. I'm sure you all remember back in 2018 when we worked through the book of 1 Samuel. Still one of my favorite sermon series to preach. And we kind of saw David's rise to power. Then in 2019, we looked at the book of 2 Samuel, where we saw David's reign over Israel. Well, today we're going to pick the story of David back up. And we're going to see what happens next. We're going to see the transition of power from King David to his son, Solomon. Now, we've just ourselves gone through a transition of power, haven't we? After 90, or at 96 years of age, and after a reign of 71 years almost, Queen Elizabeth II passed away. And the British crown was transferred from Queen Elizabeth to her son, King Charles III. Now, I'm not sure how the death of the queen made you feel. I know for some people, there were some complicated feelings. But I know for many of us, it left us feeling sad. And it was a bit disorienting. I mean, she has been the only queen that most of us have ever known. And by and large, she was a really good queen. She led faithfully and with genuine faith in Jesus. And this is why the news of her passing, many of us were left feeling sad, even a little bit apprehensive about the future. Well, this is how many people would have been feeling in Israel. King David was the only king that many of them had ever known. And he was a really good king. He led faithfully by and large. And so many of them would have been feeling apprehensive about the future. Many would have been wondering, what is next? And this is where 1 Kings picks up the story. Now, you might not be a Christian or you might be a new Christian and you might be wondering, what does this matter? What does this ancient king of Israel have to do with my life today? And the answer is probably far more than you realize. I mean, Solomon, I don't know if you much about, know much about him, but Solomon had it all. Wisdom, wealth, power, sex. He had all of it and lots of it. He had everything that we think we need to be happy. But it didn't ultimately lead him to happiness. He was actually eventually swallowed up by these very things. And so as we study his life, we're going to learn some important lessons from Solomon. But even more than just kind of helpful lessons for our lives, we're going to see the sovereign hand of God at work. Because behind the life of Solomon, behind the good, the chaotic, the messy, we're going to see the guiding hand of God. We're going to see God at work to fulfill his promises and his plans. In fact, many years earlier, God had actually made a stunning promise to King David. 
You might remember it, 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is what God said to, to David. He said, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, when you die, David, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Listen to this, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God is saying there is a king coming from the line of David and he will reign forever. Now, 71 years is a long time for Queen Elizabeth to reign, but this king will reign forever. Now, initially, it might look like this king was Solomon. Solomon has an incredible reign over Israel, really a golden age of Israel. But eventually, he will stumble and fall, and following his downfall, we're left wondering, who is this king going to be? Is God going to keep his promise? And so it's going to cause us to look ahead and to keep looking until Jesus appears. Because Jesus is the descendant of David who will reign forever. And this is actually what we celebrate at Christmas. In the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. And so this series is going to help us prepare our hearts for Christmas and for the arrival of King Jesus. So if you haven't already, make sure you grab one of the, the growth group guides along with the study questions. It has a Bible reading plan that will take you through the first 16 chapters of the book of 1 Kings. It also has some introductory material that would be helpful for you to read on the book of 1 Kings. But today, we're going to begin at the start in chapter 1. And the question, as I've already said, on everyone's lips is what's going to happen next? Who will replace King David? What type of king are they going to be? And we're going to see this chapter unfold in three main scenes. The first, if you're taking notes, is this. The first thing we see is the failing king, verses 1 to 4. As I already said, the story begins with King David in bed with bad circulation. He's old, he's cold, and he can't get warm. And so they pile a whole lot of blankets on top of him, but it does not work. So to try and raise his temperature, they come up with another plan. In the days before heaters and hot water bottles, they decide to find a beautiful woman to keep him warm. They hold a Miss Israel beauty pageant, and they find the stunning Abishag to care for David and to warm him up. Now, some commentators suggest that this is completely innocent, that Abishag is meant to be little more than a nurse or a human hot water bottle for David. But this seems unlikely. I mean, if this was simply platonic, why did they search throughout Israel for a beautiful young woman? Why did she have to be beautiful? Or why not just ask one of David's many wives to fulfill this role? This does not seem to be innocent. And so what should we make of this plan? What, what should we think about it? Well, I think we should be shocked by it. I, I think this is a largely pathetic and wicked plan. In fact, the idea that David should take the young woman Abishag into his bed, it's sadly reminiscent of the episode with Bathsheba. When he took her and used her for his own selfish purposes. What they're doing is wrong and thankfully it doesn't work. Verse 4, the king had no sexual relations with her. David's strength has failed. He's no longer up to it. His power is gone. Now think about this. The great king David, the same David who took down Goliath, who killed wild beasts with his bare hands, who performed heroic feats in battle, who conquered kings and kingdoms, who wrote many of the Psalms, who sired and started a royal dynasty. This same King David is now weak and powerless and dying. This is a sad picture. It's a little bit like when, when we used to see Muhammad Ali on TV. Muhammad Ali in his prime was the greatest boxer of all time. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. One of the greatest athletes of all time. Well, I mean, we've all seen this iconic image, haven't we? Ali standing over Sonny Liston in 1965. He was the epitome of vitality and strength. But later in his life, as I'm sure we all know, Muhammad Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. 
and the fists, which used to flatten others, they would now shake uncontrollably. The lips, which would taunt his opponents, they would now slur his words. Ali was a shadow of his former self. And this is kind of the picture that we're given of David. The giant slayer himself has been cut down. And friends, there are some important lessons here for you and for me. David's decline is a reminder of our own frailty. Human strength, human power, even at its very best, King David, Muhammad Ali, does not last long. And what happened to David will happen to us. Our hearing will fail. Our eyesight will grow dim. Our limbs will grow stiff. Our strength does not last forever. Even for my beautiful young bride, a few weeks ago, she got a bulging disc in her back. And even though she's five years younger than me, she now walks around like she's 20 years older than me, which I do not tease her about constantly. I had her permission to share that. We must face up to our frailty. We need to reckon with our mortality. Everyone, every one of us will eventually fade and die. Now, this might sound depressing, morbid, but it's reality. And it doesn't do us any good to kind of stick our heads in the sand about this, which is what so many people want to do today. The Bible actually says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. Listen to this. It says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. Now, this verse is not saying that the death is better than life. It's saying that the day of our death is actually a better teacher for us than the day of our birth. Because knowing that we are finite creatures with an expiration date, knowing that we will die one day, it helps us to live with the proper perspective. It helps us to properly order our priorities. I think about that parable that Jesus told, the man that, that stored up all this wealth and, Je- and the next day he dies and Jesus says, fool. See, if you knew that you would die tomorrow, how would you live differently today? What would be important to you? What would matter to you? And this is particularly pertinent because yesterday we had the funeral of Darvi van Rensburg. Only in his 60s, a man many of us knew and loved and passed away very suddenly. It's a vital lesson that we must all learn. David's decline is a reminder of our own frailty which should lead us to turn to God, our creator and maker and sustainer. We also learn from David's demise that God is in control, even when it doesn't seem like he is. You know, this is a a precarious position for God's kingdom. God's chosen king, God's greatest ever king outside the Lord Jesus is about to die. This is kind of like when Joseph died or when Moses died. What's going to happen next? You know, we too go through situations like this in life, don't we? When we lose someone influential to us, maybe someone who's especially influential to us in our faith. Maybe a church leader or a parent or a mentor or a spouse or a friend. When we lose them, it can be really disorienting for us and we wonder, what's going to happen next? How am I going to keep moving forward? And it's in these kind of moments that we need to remember what Jacob said to his son Joseph when he was dying. Genesis chapter 48, verse 21, Jacob said, I'm about to die, but God will be with you. This is why Charles Wesley, the the great hymn writer, once said, God buries his workmen, but carries on his work. Even when it seems like God's kingdom is shaking, God's hand is the one that holds it and steadies it. God's hand is the one that propels it forward. And this is actually what we see very clearly as chapter one of 1 Kings continues to unfold, that God's hand is at work. And this brings us to the the next scene in the story. We've seen the failing king. Next, we see the wannabe king. The wannabe king. You know, the transition of power from Queen Elizabeth to King Charles, it went very amicably and smoothly. Apart from a few awkward family dynamics, there were no coups or contests or challenges. Well, not so for King David, because Solomon was not David's only son. In fact, David had 19 sons to to different 
wives. So you can imagine there was a bit of jockeying for position. You can also imagine the grocery bill and the smell in David's household. But there was one son in particular that put his hand up for the position of king, that put himself forward. Look at verse five. Now Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, put himself forward and said, I will be king. Adonijah nominates himself and then he gets to work. He gets himself some horses and chariots. He gets himself some soldiers. He recruits some key allies. And then he holds his own coronation party. Now, to be fair, Adonijah had a fair bit going for him. He was David's oldest surviving son. David's third oldest son, Absalom, had killed his first oldest son, Amnon. And we don't know what happened to his second son, Chiliad. And you think your family's got some issues. David was the oldest surviving son, and he was also everything that, I mean, sorry, Adonijah was David's oldest surviving son and was also everything David used to be. Young, ambitious, vigorous, and apparently he was good looking. Verse six tells us that he was handsome. Now, this might sound like a good thing, but it should set off some alarm bells. I hate to break it to all you beautiful people out there, but so far in the books of First and Second Samuel, it has not been a good thing to be good looking. Phew, it's good for me. Now, do you remember Saul in First Samuel chapter nine, the first king of Israel? Tall, dark, handsome, and a total disaster. Do you remember Absalom in Second Samuel chapter 14, apparently the most eligible bachelor in Israel, but greedy, deceitful and rejected by God. Because God doesn't look at the outward appearances. God looks at the heart. And so we shouldn't hold high hopes for handsome Adonijah. And sure enough, it's not gonna work out too well for him. His prideful grasping at the throne will lead to his downfall. But we can learn an important lesson from the example of Adonijah. The name Adonijah actually means Yahweh is king. Yahweh is Lord, God is King. Now it's kind of like those people that have ironic names. You know, when you've got someone who's really tall and his mates call him tiny, or you've got someone who's bald and his mates call him curly, Adonijah would fit right in with them because he does not live up to his name. He does not submit to God's will, he lives by his own will. He does not exalt God, he exalts himself. Adonijah is self-centered and self-focused. In fact, there's that little note that we heard in verse six in brackets. Listen to this. His father had never rebuked him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Now, this is an implication on David's parenting as much as it is on Adonijah. He was a spoiled brat. He was far too used to getting his own way, to getting what he wanted when he wanted it. And so Adonijah shows us the danger of pride, the danger of self-absorption, self-promotion. Now let's admit that this is not just an ancient problem. This is a very modern problem. In fact, the Bible says about us and our world in 2 Timothy chapter three, that people will be lovers of themselves. Let's admit there is a bit of Adonijah in all of us. The natural curve of our hearts is inward, When there is a photo of you with your friends and family, where are your eyes drawn to first? To you. How do I look? What's that in my teeth? And this is merely just a a symptom of a bigger problem. Our innate self-centeredness and self-absorption. Let's admit there's a bit of Adonijah in all of us. Let's also acknowledge there's a lot of Adonijah around us. I mean, we see the spirit of Adonijah really everywhere in our day and in our culture. We do live in a self-absorbed, self-addicted world. And we see it, sadly, even in the church. We see self-absorbed leaders building platforms for themselves, or or leaders using churches to build as their own kingdoms. We saw this last week, didn't we, in the example of Diotrephes in, in, in 3 John. Remember what we heard about him? He loves to be first. This is the spirit of Adonijah, which is inside us and around us. And so the question is, what do we do about it? Where do we turn? 
Of course, the answer is that this is exactly why Jesus Christ came. I mean, think about it. Jesus truly was first, the only begotten Son of God. Jesus truly did have every reason to boast, and yet he made himself nothing. He came not to be served, but to serve. And he even served us by dying for us. Jesus is the opposite of Adonijah. He doesn't grasp for power, he gives up power. He doesn't exalt himself, he humbles himself. And what happens? God exalts him. God lifts him up. God gives him the name that is above every other name. And this means as we now follow Jesus, as we now submit to God's spirit, we too can humble ourselves. We too can live an others-focused life as we follow the example of Jesus. We can avoid the mistake of Adonijah, of making everything about us. Now, the question is, while all this is happening, what's David doing? While his son is kind of taking his throne, what does David think about all this? The answer is not much. He's too busy lying in bed with his human hot water bottle. And it's up to other people to do something about this. And it leads us to the final scene in this chapter, which is the chosen king. We've seen the failing king, we've seen the wannabe king, and now we see the chosen king. See, as far as God was concerned, the rightful heir to David's throne, it was supposed to be Solomon. First Chronicles 22 tells us about the, the promise that God made to put Solomon on the throne. And presumably Bathsheba, who was Solomon's mother, and Nathan, the veteran prophet, they knew about this. And so they knew that Adonijah must be stopped. And so they get to work. They arrange for an audience with David, that they tell David everything that's been going on, and finally it forces David into action. David issues these instructions. Verse 33. He says, take your Lord's servants with you and have Solomon, my son, mount my own mule and take him down to Gihon. Now, for Solomon to ride David's mule, the royal mule, his personal mule, it would kind of be like seeing King Charles riding in the royal carriage. It's a sign that he is now the monarch. It's a sign of his position. David is to ride the royal mule. He, uh, sorry, had an... Solomon, not Adonijah, not David, Solomon. David goes on. Have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Solomon is to ride the royal mule and he's also to be anointed. He's to have oil poured out on his head, which is a sign that he's being set apart as God's king. David was anointed, Saul was anointed, and now Solomon is to be anointed. And then David says, blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon. Then you are to go up with him and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. And so Solomon is given the royal transportation. He receives the royal sign and he sits on the royal throne. He is being publicly and properly proclaimed as the king. Unlike Adonijah, that rebellious usurper, the one who claimed it for himself, the one who planned his own party. Solomon is God's choice as God's king over God's people. And Solomon's coronation as king leads to great joy. The priests rejoice, verses 36 to 39. The people rejoice, verse 40. Even David rejoices, verses 47 to 48. Adonijah, on the other hand, runs for his life, runs away, and then sends a message to Solomon asking for mercy, which in a good sign, Solomon grants to him. Now you might be wondering, why does this matter? What do we learn from Solomon's coronation as king? And the answer is that almost every detail of Solomon's coronation helps us to understand the kingship of Jesus. You know, during his life, Jesus once said, referring to himself, he said, something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is the king that was promised to David. Jesus is the king who is greater than Solomon. Jesus is the king who will reign forever. 
And this is why, like Solomon, Jesus rode on a donkey, a mule, into Jerusalem. His triumphal entry in Matthew 21, the king has arrived on his royal transportation. This is why, like Solomon, Jesus was anointed, but not just with oil or by a priest, but by God and with God's spirit. Do you remember at Jesus' baptism when he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes down on a dove, like a dove and rests on him. Because Jesus is not just any king, he's God's king, anointed with God's power. And of course, like Solomon, Jesus was enthroned. He would take his place at the right hand of God, not just on the throne of Israel, but on the throne of the universe. But not before something very, very strange happened. Something that never happened to any other king. King Jesus would wear a crown of thorns. King Jesus would die on a Roman cross. See, most kingdoms do anything to protect their king. I don't know if you saw the, the funeral of the queen, but there was security everywhere. And probably most of it we didn't even see. The monarch must be protected at all costs. In fact, there's a great story from the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day. The, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, he desperately wanted to watch the invasion from a battleship in the English Channel. But the US General Dwight Eisenhower desperately wanted to stop him. He was worried that the Prime Minister might be killed in battle. And when it became clear that Churchill would not be deterred, he appealed to a higher authority, King George. And the king told Winston Churchill that it, if it was the prime minister's duty to witness the invasion, it must also be his duty as king to witness the invasion from the battleship. And at this point, Churchill reluctantly agreed to back down. He knew that he could never expose the king of England to such danger. Well, friends, King Jesus did exactly the opposite. He ran directly towards the battle he didn't just stay on his throne. He didn't even just stay on a ship at a distance. He swam ashore to fight alongside us, to fight for us on our behalf. And he surrendered his body to be crucified. He laid down his life for ours. He paid the penalty of our sin. He died in our place. But a dead king is no good to anyone, and this is why Jesus is God's true king. Because Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose again. He came up out of the grave. He ascended into heaven and is now at the right hand of God, reigning and ruling over all things. And he is now the king who welcomes the unworthy. The king who died for sinners. The king who defeated death. And the king who is coming again. But the question is, is he your king? Have you bowed your knee to King Jesus? The one who loves you, has died for you, and gives everything to you. The best news is that no one is excluded, and everyone is welcome in the kingdom of God through the finished work of his son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent your son, our saviour, the Lord Jesus, that he did not stay at a distance, but he ran directly into the battle, that he defeated our enemy on our behalf. And now simply by trusting in him, we are caught up in his victory. We receive all that we could ever want, need or imagine. And so Lord, help those of us here this morning who have not yet bowed our knee to King Jesus to do so not in begrudging submission, but in glad surrender because of your great love. And Lord, help us to continue to trust King Jesus. Lord, maybe our lives look like they're out of control at the moment, 
Maybe it looks like our, our world and our lives are shaking. But help us to know that your hand is the one that holds it and steadies it and moves us forward from one degree of glory to another. And we pray this in the name of King Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.